welcome everybody to the second AGI webinar series. As you know, the Ataxia Global Initiative is hosting this webinar series for young investigators in the Ataxia field to introduce you to important aspects of various research topics. The second webinar series of the Ataxia Global Young Investigator Initiative, iScience, is about hot topics in the respective field and future research perspectives. Today, Thomas Klocketer will give the webinar clinical scales for Ataxia, current state, and ongoing development. And I have the honor to introduce Thomas Klocketer. <laughs> Professor Thomas Klockerter initiated, I know, I think all we know all of those large and impressive cohort studies in ataxia, such as Euroscar, RISCA, the ESME cohort, um, and also initiated the ataxia global initiative. He studied medicine at the University of Göttingen and during this time also carried out research at the Max Planck Institute of Experimental Medicine and after graduating, he went to Oldenburg uh, for clinical training and then returned to the Max Planck Institute um, to work first uh, in basic research on Parkinson's disease. He completed his neurology training in Tübingen, where he also began to focus on those degenerative ataxias. So these research lines, in particular in ataxias, um, evolved very successfully during his appointment here in Bonn where he is the head of the Department of Neurology and also the director of clinical research at the German Center of Neurodegenerative Diseases. So we are very happy to have you here. So many thanks for being here today. Um, and before we start with the talk, um, I would like to remind every participant, um, just as a housekeeping note, um, that this webinar will be recorded. And with this, I would like to all of the participants coming from, as I saw on the list, uh, from industry as well as from academia uh, to be here and enjoy the talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the um, invitation and for the introduction. I also would like to welcome uh, you for the seminar on clinical scales for a text, our current state and ongoing developments. I can only see Ira, Jennifer, and Heike, what is nice, uh, but unfortunately, I cannot see anyone else. But nevertheless, I hope uh, that uh, everybody is well and uh, will enjoy uh, the webinar. So this is the webinar outline. Uh, I will start with some general comments and definitions related to clinical outcome assessment, COAs. Uh, in the second part, I will introduce uh, the most important clinical scales, which in FDA terminology are now named clinician reported outcomes, ClinRose for ataxia. And then in the third and final part, uh, I will focus on SARA, uh, discuss weaknesses of SARAs and options and ongoing activities for modification. So this uh, first uh, slide is uh, taken from uh, one of the FDA uh, guidance document, uh, documents related to patient-focused drug development. Uh, and uh, in these guidance documents, uh, the FDA uh, describes uh, the framework and the process how uh, clinical outcome assessments should be developed and uh, should be developed and modified so that they are fit for purpose. So this is the FDA uh, terminology and fit for purpose here. The purpose uh, we are all uh, discussing and thinking of is the use in a specific clinical trials. Um, according to FDA, uh, and this is widely acknowledged. Uh, there are four different types of COAs. First, uh, the patient reported outcome measures, uh, the PROMs. Here, the reports come directly from patients and usually they report on symptoms like pain or falls uh, and uh, also on activities of daily living, whether they are able to uh, enter a bus or um, um, how independent they are in everyday life. Uh, so my 
webinar today will not be related to the prompts, but uh, I want to say here in advance that at the beginning uh, that the prompts, so the direct patient view, the reports from the patients uh, are uh, of uh, enormous importance and are increasingly uh, requested uh, by regulators, in particular um, FDA, and uh, they may even be in the future primary outcomes for intervention trials. Then the observer reported outcomes here, the reports come from someone other than the patient and other than a health professional, a medical doctor or study nurse. So this is uh, very important and useful for studies in young children or in demented patients. This may be of importance uh, for trials, future trials in uh, toxic children. Uh, but uh, here uh, in my talk, I will focus on adults, so this will not be further considered. And the third type, and this is where I will focus on, are the clinical scales or uh, clinician reported outcome measures, which is more or less identical clinical scale, ClinRO. Here, uh, the ClinRO's uh, are related to observable signs, so something that you can observe and assess in a neurological examination, for example, the amplitude of a tremor. Uh, and these uh, reports and assessments are usually done by healthcare professionals, medical doctors, or study nurses. And finally, uh, the performance outcome measures um, are based on standardized, often timed tests like the PATA test or the nine-hole pegboard. Um, they are also important at the current state. I would say that they are very useful to complement prompts and clinical scales, uh, but uh, with the uh, available uh, performance outcome measures, the available lack the sensitivity and the specificity so that I don't believe that they are currently fit for purpose, fit for a clinical trial. So the next slide is also taken from the most recent uh, document on this uh, patient-focused drug development and uh, describes the framework, the process, how a fit for purpose clinical outcome ass assessment uh, is developed. And uh, the most important thing is that it starts, uh, or that the basis for this, the uh, requirement is a very uh, deep, thorough understanding of the specific disease. And uh, one major component of this uh, understanding is the direct uh, input from patients, uh, the patient experience, the patient perspective. But this is not all uh, to develop a fit for purpose uh, clinical outcome assessment. Uh, there's also a need for precise knowledge of the natural history uh, study, additional input from other um, stakeholders. And uh, what is very important, uh, the patient subpopulation needs to be clearly defined, which is particularly relevant in ataxia. You can define something for ataxia as a whole, but you can also define a clinical outcome assessment for a specific disease like Friedreich's ataxia or SCAR3. And even if you define it for a certain disorder, uh, you still have... Uh, to define the subpopulation. Maybe in the future, there will be trials in SCAR mutation carriers, uh, which are very close uh, to the onset of clinical ataxia. So for such individuals, you need other clinical outcome assessments compared to SCAR3 patients, uh, which are far advanced and maybe already sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, this is more or less uh, the same framework, but focused on the uh, clinical um, on the um, clinical scales. Uh, the feelings of patients uh, are reported as symptoms. The activities are reported as activities in daily living, and these uh, then uh, can be assessed by. Uh, 
patient reported outcome measures by prawns. Here, uh, we are dealing with science, with objective science. Uh, and um, the first and important uh, step is to define a concept of interest. And the concept of interest might be uh, that is based on the patient experience. So you receive the patient experience, you learn from the patient uh, that a real everyday problem is that they fall. Uh, and in this case, falls might be uh, the concept of interest. This is very focused. Currently, we have clinical scales which are wider, which try to assess the whole syndrome of ataxia, um, consisting of gait and posture abnormalities on coordination deficits and um, dysarthric speech. Uh, so this is uh, what is currently done, but uh, if you do this systematic development of a clinical outcome assessment or of a clinical scale in this case, you first have to define is ataxia, is the syndrome of ataxia, as we understand it as neurologists, is that a valid concept of interest? And only if you have the data from the patient experience saying that the syndrome of ataxia, as we understand it, is a valid concept of interest, then you can go to the development or assessment of the scale. And just for the example, ataxia, it's clear that you cannot measure it with one item. You need a number of items, gait, stance, uh, speech, and so on. And these items uh, then contribute to one total severity score. So uh, here we are talking about composite scores. And if you have such a composite score like the FARS or the SARA, you need to analyze uh, the score do and uh, define a measurement model. So this is the background as, as it is uh, defined uh, by the FDA uh, and all further discussions about clinical scales have to take this, uh, keep this in mind. Uh, I'm now continuing with the second part of my talk, which is related to the existing clinical scales or ataxia, uh, which are here given in this table in a chronological disorder. So the very first was the ICARS, uh, which was already published in 97. Uh, and, and then uh, the Friedreich scales followed in 2005. And in 2006, uh, we published uh, the SARA uh, which is currently the clinical scale for a text star that is most widely used. If you uh, have a closer look uh, on these existing scales, uh, there are two categories. Uh, the first category is, uh, are those scales related to a, a taxia in general? That is the ICAS, that is SARA, and also the brief ataxia rating scale that was developed and validated by Jeremy Schmarman. And in contrast, there are two scales uh, which are related to specific diseases, uh, the FARS uh, for Friedreich's ataxia and the NESCA for SCAR3. FARS has four parts. The first is a staging, the second is an activity of daily living scale, and the third part is the clinical scale. So in this list of clinical scales, uh, I'm referring to part three of the Friedreich's ataxia rating scale. If we have a closer look at the general ataxia scales, uh, there are some differences between these uh, threes, uh, between these three. First, um, um, the ICARS is much longer and takes more time. What um, doctors don't like, uh, and uh, the advantage both of SARA and FAS is that both scales are very focused and can be applied uh, in short time. Um, then in ICARS and BARS, uh, oculomotor deficits are considered, which is not the case in SARA. So when we developed SARA in the first version, we also had included oculomotor uh, abnormalities, 
but uh, then found uh, that the assessment was very unreliable uh, and uh, that the results were not related to the construct uh, ataxia. Obviously, uh, we measured different things with the ocular motor item than with all other items. So that uh, was the reason why we decided, uh, decided at that time in 2006 to completely omit uh, the ocular motor items. Uh, here in these numbers, which are percentages, you can see a weighting of the different ataxia domains in the uh, different uh, scales. And you can see that in SARA, we have a strong weight on postural gait, what I feel is um, a very important feature because um, posture and gait abnormalities are the first signs of ataxia. Uh, and in the entire disease course, uh, they are a predominant feature of the disease and important uh, for everyday life uh, in patients. Uh, one uh, additional comment to the disease-specific uh, scales, free drugs and uh, FARS part three and NESCA here, you have the category others, which is particularly large for the NESCA. Uh, and uh, with these, in these other categories, um, abnormality signs are assessed, which are not related to um, ataxia. Uh, or only indirectly related to ataxia. For example, the FAST part three, you have one part related to peripheral nervous system. Um, SARA is uh, the scale that is currently most widely used and we have the largest volume of data on SARA. So I will uh, give a very short introduction of SARA, although I believe that the majority of you know SARA very well and may even have used or uh, uh, often using uh, the scale. So we have eight items. Uh, they have a different scoring. So because we believe that gait was more important and the heel shin, uh, the maximal gait score is eight and the maximal heel shin score is only four. There are a number of studies in which uh, the scale was validated and tested for reliability. And there are specific uh, studies uh, showing the validity for the scars for free drugs, but also for free drugs, uh, for scars, free drugs, ataxia, and for the sporadic ataxia. Um, other than a number of other scales, SARA is completely free. You can download it from the original publication in neurology or here from the Ataxia Study Group uh, website. There is an online, online training tool that is also free for all members of the Ataxia Global Initiative. And there is a shortened uh, version, the SARA Home, uh, which consists of five items, a selection of five of the eight items and uh, the SARA home can be applied by patients themselves at home and recorded uh, by video. There's an app, the Aparito app, which allows to transfer then the data uh, to the study center. Uh, and this is a, a very useful instrument to study the day-to-day -day fluctuation of the performance. I will go very quickly through the uh, performance of SARA. This is not a training webinar uh, on performing uh, this test, but rather a general discussion on clinical scales and on future developments. So we start in SARA with the gate uh, the normal gait is followed then by the tandem gait, if possible. Uh, then there's a testing of stance uh, with the precise instruction. This is followed by sitting on an examination uh, bed. Uh, the fourth item is the speech test, uh, which is not shown on a video. Item five is the finger chase, uh, where we are interested in the dysmetria of movements. Uh, item six, the nose finger 
where we specifically look for the tremor, not for the ataxia in general, but for the tremor. Uh, and uh, then the fast alternating movements. And uh, the final item is uh, the heel shin test. Um, I will present a little bit of available data about uh, Sarah um, first, um, other than for other um, scales, uh, we have uh, a study and a group of more than 400 healthy individuals. Uh, so we have a rational basis uh, for um, defining a cutoff between the normal healthy population and the ataxic population. And uh, until the age of 60 years, it's a cutoff of three. And this is exactly the cutoff that we used without having these data in previous study where we focused on mutation carriers. So this is a valid cutoff, but if you go into the details, it's only valid uh, for uh, individuals up to the age of 60 years. Uh, if you're performing a study, maybe in SCAR 6 or in uh, CANVAS RFC1 a disease with older individuals, you have to consider that beyond the age of 60, uh, the cutoff between the healthy population and the ataxic population is 4.5. And beyond the age of 70, it's even 6.5. Uh, I mentioned that we have a large amount of data. This is from the Euroscar study with the eight year follow up. Where you see this linear increase of SARA scores for the four most frequent uh, SCAR diseases and the differences with the fastest increase in SCAR1, slower in SCAR2 and SCAR3, and the slowest but also linear increase in SCAR6. Uh, in 2008, uh, we then initiate the, uh, initiated the RISCA uh, study, which was a study of risk persons, both uh, mutation carriers and risk persons who were not mutation carriers and the investigators did not know who was an in mutation carrier and who was um, negative. So this is a blinded comparison. And we used the SARA, although uh, we did not believe that we would find uh, anything because uh, SARA was developed to measure attacks on patients. And here we were dealing with risk persons who were before the clinical onset of ataxia. But to our surprise, there were at the first cross sectional comparison between the mutation carriers and uh, the risk persons who were not mutation carriers. There were clearly clear differences in the SARA score at a very low level. We are here below the three, but these differences were significant. Uh, in SCAR6, uh, the latency to the expected uh, onset of ataxia was much larger. So we were he here dealing with participants who, who were 20 years before the onset of ataxia. So uh, there was no difference. Uh, so obviously, uh, SARA might also be useful uh, for studies in pre-ataxic mutation carriers. Uh, and we have studied uh, this in further detail. Uh, this is a work of uh, Heike Jacobi. Uh, and uh, this is still in the review process. And we very much hope that it will soon be accepted and then generally available. Uh, and here we combined, combined the longitudinal data of the Euroscar and the RISCAR cohort, and the RISCAR cohort only of the mutation carriers. And you can see, have here a comprehensive view of the development of uh, SARA um, starting 15 to 20 years before the clinical onset of ataxia, which is time point zero. And at time point zero, on average, you have a 
Sarah score around three or four until the advanced stages uh, 20, 25 years after the clinical onset of ataxia. Again, you can see the differences between SCAR 1, 2, 3, and 6. You also see that in the advanced stages, there is some sealing effect with the SARA, which is uh, not surprising. But what is very important, if you go back uh, to the time before the onset, 5 to 10 year before clinical onset of ataxia, there is already an increase of SARA. And in the time period between five years before onset and five years after onset, there is a linear increase. And this time period around uh, the clinical onset, some years before and some years after the onset, at least in my view, and I think many pharma companies share this view as a very interesting time window for initiating uh, therapies uh, which have the goal to modify uh, the disease. If you do it very late in descent or gene therapy, it will not help because there's already advanced degeneration. On the other hand, you cannot initiate an invasive risky therapy in healthy individuals which may develop ataxia in 20 years. But this time window is uh, very interesting. And here, SARA has an almost linear increase uh, and is sensitive to change. Now, experiences with uh, SARA in clinical trials. Um, and with this, uh, the discussion of the weaknesses and problems with SARA start. And the whole story started uh, with the very first Biohaven study on Trorilozole, which is a deriv derivative of Rilozole. And um, when uh, Biohaven submitted uh, the study protocol to the FDA, and this is several years ago, uh, the FDA made the statement, uh, SARA is not acceptable as a primary outcome measure. They gave a number of reasons. Uh, the most important reasons were that they argued uh, a number of items are not relevant for the patient. So what difference is it whether you have a tremor of two or five centimeters? This is not relevant uh, for a patient. Um, Similarly, the heel shin test, this is not reflecting an everyday situation. So they suggested that only the first four items, a gait, stand, sitting, and um, speech uh, um, are relevant. And they also requested uh, that all uh, items uh, should uh, have the same scoring range. And in many, not in all, but in many, uh, clinical scales, the scoring range uh, goes from zero to four, so five uh, stages. Uh, so the consequence was that Biohaven developed a new scale, the functional SARA, which has only uh, four items, uh, the first four of SARA, and uh, in which uh, the scoring range uh, was reduced to zero to five, and uh, the single scores were modified. And um, Biohaven performed the Trorilozole trials with this um, scale, and um, this is from one of their recent press releases. Uh, and in this press re release, they say Biohaven clinical trials in SCAR were first of its kind in this area and utilized a newly developed rating scale, the functional SARA, FSARA, that was developed in close consultation with the FDA using standard regulatory pathways to elucidate this new scale. Um, this scale uh, has been used in particular in the US by many uh, investigators. So there are many all important uh, Texas centers have in US have been participating in these uh, Biohaven trials. So uh, many of the investigators know this functional SARA very well, but the functional SARA has not been published. 
and I'm not allowed uh, to discuss uh, the functional SARA. Uh, so um, we have to wait until uh, the company has done further analysis of the functional SARA and uh, will uh, then hopefully publish uh, the FSARA in the current situation, uh, we cannot uh, use it. On the other hand, um, there's another trial that I would like to highlight. Uh, this is a uh, trial with an acet acetyl leucine, a compound that is marketed in France uh, as Tanganyu. And uh, we here in Bonn and many other German centers participated in a study on Taganil in a mixed population of a TEXA patient and a post hoc analysis showed, uh, and this was negative, and a post hoc analysis showed uh, that uh, it obviously had an effect in a number of rare recessive diseases, among them Nima pick type C and uh, consequently a phase three trial was um, started and the principal investigator is Michael Strupp in München. Uh, this is uh, the published uh, study protocol and here again, a very recent um, press release of uh, the pharma company Intrabio that is sponsoring uh, the trial. And uh, the good news is the phase three trial of an acetylucine in Niemann pick type C disease met the primary endpoint and key secondary endpoints, showing high statistical signif significance. And uh, in this study, the primary endpoint was the conventional SARA. And uh, they report a clinically meaningful. 1.37 reduction of the SARA total score uh, in this 12 week study. And that was uh, performed in US and in Europe. So uh, the study protocol was accepted uh, by the FDA and uh, the company is, as you can read here, planning to file for marketing authorization with FDA, but also the um, European medical agency. So this is a bit difficult and confusing. On the one hand, FDA says uh, SARA is not acceptable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they accepted a trial with a positive uh, outcome in which SARA was uh, the primary outcome. Before further discussing SARA and future developments, uh, I would like to have a brief look on the FARS and the FARS part three, the clinical scale. And uh, this is the additional, uh, the um, initial uh, FARS, and it was published in 2005. And as I mentioned, uh, there are a number of domains that are uh, related to Texia, but also a number of items, five items related uh, to uh, peripheral nervous system. And in 2019, uh, the modified FARS and other than the functional SARA, this was an open and transparent process. This modified version was uh, published. You can read it in detail, but um, the uh, major modification was that all the peripheral nervous system uh, items were omitted and the bulba items uh, were reduced to speech and calf. So as Massimo Pandolfo stated at, at a recent meeting, uh, this is the sarification of uh, the FARS. There's the FARS in the beginning at the ataxia items and the peripheral nervous system. It's now as the SARA uh, related only in parentheses uh, to ataxia. And this is an uh, obvious success story. Uh, the MFARS, uh, the modified FARS clinical scale uh, was used as a primary outcome in the MOXI trial, UMA veloxolone in Friedreich's ataxia. And most of you will know uh, this was a positive uh, trial. This was uh, the first publication, 21 
uh, last year there was follow-up data published in movement uh, disorders and um, now uh, Uma Veloxolon is already approved in US and it will be approved and available for patients uh, in uh, Europe. Now I will continue with the third uh, part and here completely focus on SARA. And um, I have here reported a number of strengths, uh, particularly uh, enormous amount of data we have for SARA, but also the weaknesses and we'll discuss possibilities how we can improve, modify, optimize. Uh, Sarah, and I'll start again with the statements and requests of the FDA. And they say an endpoint based on a clinical outcome assessment here, a clinical scale, a ClinRO should reflect an aspect of the patient's health that is meaningful and should be capable of supporting an inference of treatment effect within the context of the planned clinical trial. And so the first question that is not finally answered yes, and that touched already is, is the question, is ataxia, which is a clinical syndrome defined by neuro neurologists, is ataxia a valid concept of interest? Or is that a construct made by neurologists and not interesting for patients and patients are interested how often they fall or whether their speech is understandable. So this has to be, uh, this question has to be answered. And in connection with this question, uh, you have to look at each single item and answer the question whether all items are meaningful and reflect a valid concept of interest. And so what we have uh, to do we have to collect all available data on symptoms experienced by ataxia patients. And there's a number of studies which were the basis for the development of the PROM ataxia of Jeremy Schmalmann, but also surveys from ataxia UK um, in which patients were asked, what are your everyday problems, which are the most important? So there are data, the patient experience, and this has to be analyzed and we have to analyze the relation of this patient experience to the SARA as a whole, but also to single items. Are there complaints of patients which we can directly relate to the tremor or to uh, fast alternating movements and so on? The second uh, criticism uh, from um, FDA uh, were related to the item structure and um, a number of studies specifically looked at the item structure uh, of uh, SARA. And this is a study based on the uh, SCA3 individuals from the ESME cohort it's published uh, last year. Uh, and uh, this is not only a cross-sectional study, but also uh, there was a one year follow up in a considerable part of the patients. And you can see that all uh, items contribute uh, to the annual change. And here you can see the um, um, percentages. The finger chase had a smaller contribution and there was no contribution from the nose finger test. So in this uh, one year follow up of, um, I believe, 160, uh, SCA3 patients, uh, there was no uh, deterioration of the nose finger test within this one year. And it was suggested, uh, I'm one of the co-authors, but this is a suggestion where I do not fully agree to simply skip uh, and omit the nose finger test. Another study that was uh, published in 2023 uh, this is a cross-sectional study on a large population of uh, patients with recessive ataxia, very mixed population. You can see all the different uh, diagnoses here. Um, and uh, here you can see the relation of each single item um, to the 
SARA total score. And um, here again, uh, the um, conclusion of the authors was uh, that uh, the items related to arm movements to coordination do not contribute uh, very much to the total score. And they also suggested uh, that uh, with a reduced number of items in which uh, these coordination items are omitted, uh, you might have a scale uh, which is uh, more um, sensitive. Again, I do not fully agree. Uh, what is very obvious is that gait and stance uh, have a very steep uh, rise here with the total SARA score, so they are very sensitive. But uh, you can also see that uh, both um, relations between this single score and the total score is almost identical. So here we have two items which measures which measure the same. Uh, and if you uh, have a composite score, uh, it is very useful uh, to have different tasks, different items with a different difficulty, uh, which uh, show different aspects of the disease. Uh, and another problem with the gate and stance item is that there is some ceiling effect. So in the most advanced patients, uh, they lack sensitivity, what is understandable if patients, once they are in a wheelchair, uh, you cannot measure any further progression of uh, gait and stance capability. And this is the advantage of the finger chase, nose finger, and also the speech disturbance. Here you can see uh, that uh, the curve is steeply rising uh, at, uh, in patients with advanced disease. And this is easy to understand. So uh, if you're sitting in a wheelchair, there can still be a further deterioration of arm coordination. And this is a frequent problem, particular free drugs attacks here where many young free drug patients uh, are already sitting in the wheelchair, but still have a good quality of life. But then with further progression, coordination and speech is getting worse and worse. So here again, I would like to remind uh, you of the uh, FDA guidance um, fit for purpose. If you want to do a study in uh, mutation carriers, which are at the beginning of the disease, just starting with the attacks, yeah, um, the gait and stance might be most important. On the other hand, uh, people sitting in wheelchair are also suffering, even more suffering and they also need consideration and there should be also trials with symptomatic treatments, maybe with transcranial magnetic stimulation or anti-ataxic drugs. And if you are designing a trial in this population, uh, you should rather focus on these items. And the problem with the finger chase and nose finger is that in this intermediate range, uh, they are very, uh, flat. Uh, and this is exactly the explanation why in the ASME uh, study here, the nose uh, finger test uh, did not contribute uh, very much because the majority of patients here were in this intermediate range where you still have an increase of gait and stance, uh, but a little increase uh, or deterioration uh, in these um, arm coordination items. Um, so uh, I already criticized uh, the suggestion to omit single items, and I gave here a number of arguments why I believe that all items are very important, may be modified, but nevertheless, I believe that they are very important. And I come back uh, to Heike's uh, study where we combined the Euroscan and RISCA cohort, and I already mentioned uh, this early phase, which is dominated uh, by gait and posture abnormalities, and in which uh, SARA uh, takes a linear, quite steep increase. And we uh, focused on this period, five years before onset and five years after onset of clinical manifest ataxia. And we found that in this period, which may be interest for 
uh, interventions with trial, SAVA has a quite high um, sensitivity to change, uh, more than one. Uh, and because this is, as I mentioned, dominated uh, by the abnormalities of gait and posture, we did the same analysis for the first four uh, items, the SARA axial. And I would predict uh, that if we had used uh, the functional SARA, uh, which also contains only these four items, uh, we found that the sensitivity is considerably smaller. So even in this very early population, including patients on mutation carence before the onset of ataxia, uh, the arm coordination items uh, contribute uh, to the total score and increase uh, the sensitivity. So in my view, they are not only useful for the last, uh, widely advanced stages, they are, they are very necessary, but they are also useful in these early stages. There's another uh, data set which is not yet published, but this was uh, reported uh, on a meeting on uh, clinical ataxia scales, uh, which we held in uh, January in Bonn, and uh, the manuscript is already written and that will be submitted soon. Uh, and uh, so this is personal communication from Mats Carlson with a um, statistician, biostatistician from Göteborg in Sweden. And he performed an item response theory analysis. And this is a type of analysis that is, according to these guidance documents, requested uh, by uh, the uh, FDA. Uh, and um, the theory behind uh, the IRT item response theory is that composite scores are used uh, to measure a latent variable. So you have the gait and you have the speech and you have the arm movements, but you are interested in a construct or in a latent variable for SARA, it's the ataxia. Uh, and the question is whether the single items are related to this common uh, latent variable and uh, the results uh, summarized here that SAVA captures one single latent uh, variable. The analysis of each single characteristic show that all items have good discriminatory values and that all items were informative uh, with varying levels depending on the ataxia level. And there was also a conclusion from these expert biostatisticians who also used uh, the IRT approach for a number of other uh, scales, including the UPDIS. And uh, the conclusion was uh, that SARA, with respect to these uh, criteria, is superior uh, to um, all other uh, scales which uh, Mats Carlson tested in the fields of uh, neurodegenerations and uh, movement uh, disorders. Nevertheless, um, although there are obvious strengths of uh, SARA, we need to go back uh, to SARA. So the AGI decided to develop a modified or optimized uh, SARA and uh, the plan is to really start from the beginning to, to collect uh, the patient experience, define the concept of interest, clarify, clarify whether the taxa is a useful, valid concept of interest, then analyze uh, the meaningfulness of single items and uh, modify them if necessary, define a uniform scoring range from zero to four, improve instructions and definitions, although they are quite precise, there are always uncertainties and can be improved. And when we have gone through these steps, uh, we are planning to write to create a manual which is far more detailed uh, than the current definitions, how to instructions and definitions. And we will also adapt, uh, adapt the, the training tool. In 
parallel, there's the plan uh, to develop a specific gait and posture scale because gait and posture is affected early in the disease course and because uh, impairment of gait and posture is highly relevant for patients. Uh, and the hope is that this is a, a score that is highly sensitive in these very early phases and even uh, in the years before the onset of ataxia. Currently, there are no specific plans how to do that, but uh, the section E uh, related to upright stability of the fast clinical scale could give some hints how that could be done. If you look at the items, particularly uh, the stands, uh, there is standing with feet together, standing with in tandem stands, and standing, first standing also with feet apart, but then even standing with dominant foot. So this may be uh, already uh, challenging for some healthy, untrained uh, persons. Uh, but um, at least here, this is a background information how one could uh, design such a um, gait and posture scale that is very sensitive for the very first uh, posture problems in ataxia patients. And uh, these uh, items here stands with feet together, particular tandem stands and stands on dominant foot. Uh, in the free drugs it takes a population like the effects and the US studies and the moxie, there were all ceiling effects. They all had a uh, scoring of four, but this might then be particularly useful to have an instrument. This is uh, highly sensitive in the early stage. And I think this was my final slide and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I uh, would like to ask you questions. I understand that you need to write them up and that uh, Ira or Jennifer or Heike uh, will uh, then read them. Exactly. So first of all, thank you very much for this broad and in-depth overview um, that I think not only outlined what has been developed with great success, but also the limitations that might be not that limiting as, as probably anticipated by the FDA. So um, up to now, I don't see any, here we go, any question. Um, so first question is, is there any useful scale validated for children? Yes, Sarah has been uh, studied and uh, validated uh, for children. I was not personally involved uh, that uh, I think this is ongoing activity also in the European uh, Rare Disease Network. And uh, this has to be adapted uh, for the specific age. I showed uh, the normal values uh, of Marcus. Uh, studies and they started with 20 years, but um, if you are studying children at uh, the age of one, two or three years, I think you have a completely different normal range. So I would have one question regarding um, this patient reported outcome measures here. Um, in the first part of your talk, you mentioned that you would um, envision them to get more and more important um, as really outcome measures in clinical trials. What do you think? Why is that not yet the case? So what is lacking? Is it the, the validation? Is it the ataxia specific scale? Um, or what do you I think that first uh, really ataxia specific uh, patient reported outcome that was systematically developed who was Jeremy Schmarman's uh, Prometexia. There was a recent publication in Cerebellum uh, on a, with a similar approach, uh, but related to uh, recessive ataxia. So now we have ataxia specific instruments. Uh, the problem is uh, that we currently have no uh, 
longitudinal data. And I would predict uh, that they are less sensitive uh, than the clinical scales, but this has to be seen. But uh, what I feel very promising are the um, ADL scales in the US car. We used uh, an ADL scale that was uh, derived from the Huntington scale and uh, with uh, um, SME and also in the uh, free drug studies, uh, the part two of FARS is used. Uh, and uh, there are a large amount of longitudinal data and uh, they show uh, that uh, the sensitivity to change of the ADL scale is at least in the same range under some circumstances, even higher uh, than that of the clinical scale. And we also have these data in uh, SCA3 from the ESMI cohort, and, and uh, I hope we will have capacity and time to analyze them very soon. There's another question from Annette Merbes. Is the NESCA used in SCA3 patients? If not, why not widely used? Yeah, NESCA uh, was developed in Brazil. Uh, I think you know, Annette, that uh, there is this large Brazil SCA3 population initially uh, originating from Portugal uh, and um, the investigators uh, in particular, Laura Yardim, but um, also many others in Brazil to uh, excellent uh, work. And they specifically developed uh, the NESCA and they're using uh, NESCA in their observational trials, but for some time they have also added uh, the SARA so that in the Brazil cohort data, we have both the NESCA and uh, the SARA. Um, Laura is also performing a study in mutation carriers, the big pro study. And here uh, she showed that in the pre-symptomatic, <clears throat> in the pre-ataxic, pre-ataxia um, period, uh, the NESCA is even uh, more sensitive than SARA, which is explained by the fact that SCAR3 patients may already have a double vision or cramps in the SCAR2. So uh, before ataxia starts, there may be a non-ataxia symptoms and these symptoms are addressed uh, by NESCA. On the other hand, NESCA is a mixed bag. It has ataxia items and then a wide vari variety of non-ataxia items so it might be more appropriate and uh, uh, better to separate this to have one ataxia scale and an additional scale that measures non-ataxia, uh, non-cerebellar um, manifestations. And it's never been used outside Brazil to my knowledge. Hey, then now I... I think there's a last question. Uh, Roberto now wrote it down. So uh, from uh, Roberto Rodriguez Labrada. First, congrats for the professor for his nice talk. My question Thank is related, <laughs> related with the scoring of stands in preclinical or slight ataxia. In some times, we have cases able to complete the tandem gate task for 10 seconds, but with oscillations. The current instruction only considered time in the task, not the oscillations. In these cases, what would be the scoring? Yeah, this is a very good point. And, and this is a problem that we uh, also experience uh, here in our studies that um, uh, if there is very strong oscillations and movements of the arm, uh, even if uh, the patient uh, achieves to stand 10 seconds, uh, we say that uh, this was a failure. Uh, but this is specifically an example where we need more detailed instructions and uh, if uh, there is a modified uh, version of SARA, an optimized uh, version, uh, I already announced uh, that we will uh, also write a manual. And in this manual, uh, these difficult situations will be addressed and uh, defined. Uh, 
but currently, and I think this is also in the training tool, um, in such a case, uh, we would say, no, uh, it's a failure. Okay, with this very practical last question, um, we would again like to thank you, Thomas, for this talk and um, for um, the Q&A section.